So I want to talk about failure, and I can rightfully talk about it because I know it well. I've had lots of it. From the time I was young, I had big dreams of fame and fortune and visions of changing the world. I was a singer, dancer, and actor. I starred in theater, television, and films, but music was my first love. I played live and recorded CDs. Years of childhood pain drove my art. I was talented and brave, a rebel, a rule breaker, a risk taker. I was the one who would make it, and I did everything perfectly to ensure that. But then, life happened. In my mid-twenties, at what was the height of my musical career, I aimed for the stars. My well-intentioned but novice manager said I was too good for Canada, so she went to L.A. to secure a record deal. Unfortunately, the record company she spoke with were the wrong fit. They were top 40 in R&B labels, yet I was writing alternative trip-hop before there was a name for it, so a deal didn't happen. I remember the day when a new artist whose music was comparable to mine broke out with her first EP. I overheard an ex-boyfriend speaking to a friend about me. He said, it's such a shame. It should have been her. She missed the boat. And that was it. In an instant, hundreds of encouraging voices were silenced by one. Doubt crept in. My sole identity was that of a successful artist. How could I exist if not as that? The voices that I'd heard throughout my life suggesting how difficult it was to succeed grew louder and louder. Eventually, I visited a therapist. In our first session, she listened to my dilemma. What should I do? I asked. After years of fighting for my perfectionistic vision, I'd become clinically depressed, anxious, had panic attacks, and burnout from being consumed with concerns of financial instability. The notion of potential failure was constant. A few days later, I went back for session two. My therapist had considered my situation and had an answer. In a nutshell, she said, as long as I kept music in my life, my pain would persist. I left her office 10 minutes later, stunned, and did the inconceivable for a person whose dream meant everything to them. I quit. And when a few record execs expressed interest in representing me weeks later, I shut the door. I believed this action was one of self-care. It was clear my ego was running the show. Finally, it became more important to seek inner peace rather than external success. Deep inquiry helped me recognize that my identity wasn't wholly wrapped up in music, but still, the choice to quit haunted me. Although I left music, music never left me. I stopped going out to see live shows and was unable to listen to the radio. When people asked when I'd be playing next, I changed the subject. My life changed. I delved deeper into the Dharma. I moved to a different part of the city, dated an electrical engineer, and started teaching. For a couple of years, I made efforts to explore life as a non-artist, but the act of creation was too embodied in my being. One evening, as I watched a Martha Stewart made-for-TV movie, an inspiration for a children's television series shot through me like fire, and instantly, a new career was born. I would be a writer. This series would be larger than life and would inspire, educate, and empower children everywhere. I got my mojo back. A new path began. I began writing and developing the project. I did the rounds at festivals. I flew across the country to meet with producers. I negotiated an option and actually developed the series with a few companies. But ultimately, it never came to fruition. I had a ton of almosts, but no victory. So after five years of investing all my time, energy, and personal savings into this one project, I walked away. Defeat can be incredibly difficult to rise from because the project was a failure. It meant that I was a failure. This is what we learn to equate achievement with self-worth. Shame is an insidious emotion. It can build and build until it debilitates us. Suddenly, we view our lives as a series of consecutive failures. The reason for this is obvious. We live in a world where we've learned to develop our identity through accomplishment. So much so that failure drives us to isolation, depression, and even suicide. We've become obsessed with others' victories and spend chunks of our day comparing our lives with others through the false lens of inadequacy. 
We're never fast enough or rich enough or successful enough. It's so important for us to succeed that the risk of failure becomes so high, we decidedly let go of our dreams or otherwise lose the best of ourselves fighting for them. What we're missing is that there's a middle ground. It's not all or nothing. Our perspective of failure is incomplete. We've been taught that it's the enemy and should be avoided at all costs. And if we just keep practicing, we'll get there. But the little engine that could was wrong. Sometimes practice doesn't make perfect. And no matter how hard we try, we're sometimes unable to achieve a goal. I fear a world where success continues to be taught as the be-all and end-all and antidepressants and sleep medication fill the shelves of each home. We've become so hardwired to believe that the goal is all that matters. We're missing the beauty of everything in between, neither accepting our limitations nor celebrating our efforts. If we fail, it's our fault, and we whip ourselves accordingly. Stuck in our delusion, we forget that all defeat is preceded with a leap, and that failure represents having taken a great risk, yet we've been conditioned to brush that notion under the carpet as irrelevant. Failure isn't the issue. The issue is our view of it and our response to it, but we can change the messages we tell ourselves and others, such as, it's okay to try simply for the sake of trying, and that if a goal isn't reached, that's okay. Post a goddamn sticky note on each room of your house that says effort is to be celebrated, not just outcome. Rather than focusing on our failed relationships, failed auditions, failed efforts, and failed ideas, we can begin to celebrate the smallest of victories. And in times of defeat, deliberately practice compassionately patting ourselves on the back for our brave efforts. If we can begin to recognize all that we gain from failure— such as lessons and humility, we might learn to reframe it as something of value. There comes a time when we have to decide if we want to fight those messages we've been convinced of and ardently work to change those beliefs to, we are good enough. And just because we may have a failure, it does not mean that we are a failure. My therapist's conclusion was wrong. The perception that I needed to protect myself by quitting was inaccurate. What I needed to do was not quit, but rather to learn how to navigate, work with, and change my relationship to fear, accept my limitations, learn to let go of my need to be perfect, and offer self-kindness post-fall. The changes I needed to make were perceptual changes within. Fortunately, I've since committed to not letting that old ingrained habitual fear of failure derail my current pursuits. So as someone who knows failure intimately, I'd like to impart a few last words. If you find your true calling, your passion, if that voice is loud and constant and knowing, listen to it. Tune out your parents' concern, the naysayers, those who have failed before you, and the need to be perfect. Focus instead on finding a way to do that thing that you're here to do so you carry no regrets. Forget about achievements and accolades and stay true to the process before you. Do it because you love it and remind yourself that's why you're doing it. And most importantly, begin to practice forgiveness and compassion each time you fail because I promise there will be failures and they should be viewed for what they are, brave efforts that should be celebrated.